The events unfolded on September the 11th, 2001, happened very quickly. Most of the details that day taking place in a matter of 102 minutes. At 545, hijackers passed through the security in Portland, Maine, boarded a flight to Boston where they connected to American Airlines Flight 11. 759, Flight 11 takes off from Boston for Los Angeles, 76 passengers on board, five hijackers as well. At 8.15, Flight 175 takes off from Boston, bound for L.A. The reason they chose this, all this was detailed. They purposely chose flights going across the country because they would be full of jet fuel, okay? 51 passengers, five hijackers on board. At 8.19, Flight 11 crew members alert ground personnel that there was a hijacking underway. At 8.20, American Flight 77 en route for Los Angeles takes off from Washington, D.C. Six crew members, 53 passengers, five hijackers. There was an attempt to communicate with passengers, a hijacker uh, at 8.24. At 8.37, Boston Air Traffic Control alerts military that Flight 11 is under the control of terrorists. At 8.42, San Francisco-bound United Airlines Flight 93 takes off from Newark, New Jersey, following a delay. Seven crew members, 33 passengers, four hijackers. Flight 11 at 8.46 flies into floors 93 through 99 of the North Tower. Impacted zone from those levels, 93, 99, any, there was over 450 above the impact zone in which there were no survivors above the impact zone of the North Tower. At 8.50, President George W. Bush was alerted, being in Florida, reading a book to some school kids. At 8.55, the South Tower is declared secure. At 9 o'clock, flight, uh, flight 175 alerts air traffic control that a hijacking is underway. At 9.03, Flight 175 crashes into floor 77 through 85 of the South Tower. When the South Tower is impacted, it has exactly one hour before it collapses. And I bring this up because most people, if you're probably, let's see, probably 35 and under, you remember those days maybe a little bit younger. Whenever you connect major emotional events, you probably remember what you were doing when you heard about the events unfolding on that day 20 years ago. I recall being and getting ready to teach a class and, and I had some students and uh, Pastor Setzer, the administrative school came and he said a paper, I don't know if you remember that, but you said a, a paper on my desk, it said, Plane Strikes World Trade Center. I looked at it and thought, well, maybe that was a single engine plane, and because uh, they do fly at that level, and uh, so, man, I hate to hear that, you know. Uh, concluding that class, uh, we seen that it was more things unfolding. By lunchtime, I can't give you the account, but I don't know how many students we have left, as we've seen countless parents coming in with with shock and all looks on their face, thinking that Jesus would return by the end of the day. And so those accounts are memorable. And as we want to, you know, as we, we think about Flight 93 and Todd Beamer and his actions of others as they tried to get the plane that was probably going to the Capitol or the White House, they were able to take and it nosedived right at 600 miles an hour in the field in Pennsylvania. And I say that for we can remember the heroism of that day. It's one of the tragic days in American history as it relates to terrorism. But it was also one of the greatest days of rescue in American history as well. Those days brought out the worst in humanity, but it also brought out the best in humanity. I want to highlight one. I want to talk to you a little bit on this subject, the man in the red bandana. 
the subsubject of the film that come out about him in 2017, his name is Wells Crowther, is he went up so that others could come down. The impact zone of the South Tower was the floor 78 through 84. 78 was the worst place that that plane could hit. It's where the sky lobby was. Once the North Tower was hit, everybody from 78 up came down to the sky lobby uh, at the 78th floor because it had the fast elevators It went straight down. That's exactly where the plane hit. 18 people survived from the 78th floor up. Only 18. And it was due to the heroism of a 24-year-old young man. What you're about to watch, and I'm going to take some time because I want you to see this. This was put on by actually ESPN. There's several videos about him. I encourage you to put up and watch the, the documentary. It's about an hour long of the man in the red bandana. I want to highlight him. But I'm taking you somewhere else as well. Because as we look at someone who went in the months, the worst humanity can provide, and he went up to the 78th floor where others could come down. The far right knee, yes. John chapter 15, I want you to see that uh, where you could get a, a little bit of what I'm trying to relate to you. Where you could see how the investment of that young man into others. Just give me 10 minutes. That's all I want to do is do a little parallel. In John chapter 15 in verse number 13, several reasons for doing that. One was to give honor where honor is due. Uh, and to bring to our remembrance, and, and that's something you can further go on and look. Two was to do a correlation here. Jesus is talking to his disciples here in John chapter 15 where uh, they had now left the uh, upper room and they're making their uh, march over to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus tells them about he's the true vine. You come over in verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, then a man laid down his life for his friends. What an interesting Greek word, greater. It's where we get our word megaphone. That same Greek word is translated 30 times in the New Testament as loud. The first time that you see the word greater love, the word greater translated in the Gospel of Matthew was Jesus cried out with a loud voice. In other words, the great love will be demonstrated on the cross as he is shouting out the greater love that no man than this, then a man lay down his life for his friends. The thing that is said on the uh, 2017 documentary, Man in the Red Bandana, he went up. He was on the 104th floor and made it down. He began when he goes down. He knows that the impact zone, he must find a way down. The Trade Center... Uh, both of them had three stairwells down, A, B, and C. In the North Tower, they all were cut right in half. There was no way down. In the South Tower, B and C was destroyed. And as one man has written, the chief of police uh, and the fire department there said, the miracle of stairway a. It was the only way down. This man goes and he finds the way down and was able to lead a uh, confirmed 12, but only 18 from that 78th floor and up got down only one way, and that was stairway A. So I want you to think about that as I have you to think about some things. One in remembrance, but one, what does that mean to me this day? It was, as I said, a tragic day, but one of the most successful rescue days in American history. Let me give you three parallels as it relates that I see, because I'm talking about one who didn't go up where others could come down, but one who came down where others can go up. When he was young, his father gave him a covering, a red bandana. He said, this is for a covering. He carried that the rest of his days. He began to carry that, and it's something that he associated with, and that heart of being a fireman of help, and, uh, and a mission and a purpose, which he stated openly, there's a greater purpose for him. 
when Jesus was 12 years old and about his father's business. Now, when Jesus came down, he was given a covering. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says, A body hast thou prepared for me. <laughs> when Christ came down, it wasn't a red bandana, but God prepared a body for him as he came, and it began to grow. And at the age of 12, as a young one, he knew his mission. He must be about his father's business when he was in the temple teaching the elite educators of his day why he knew his mission he was shouting with a megaphone of why he came so there was a preparedness this man kept his red bandana Wells did uh, not knowing that when he was born they said that these terrorists about 20 plus years prior to that began to plot against the Trade Center unfortunately there is evil out there they began to plot and scheme a strategy so the whole time that he was growing and riding his bicycle and growing up, he was being prepared for a very special purpose in his life. As he began to prepare, learned some different tactics and came a fireman, we see that Jesus, when he was 30 years old, he was baptized in his preparation work to fulfill all righteousness. Now it comes to the thing of that fateful day, executing the plan. I wonder if there was moments as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, if there be any other way, if there be any other way, and as he's there and praying and getting the deep help that he needs, and he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I wonder if his second or third or fourth, they say as many as five trips down to the 60-something floor and back up to the 78th floor, if it ever dawned on him to keep going on down. But yet he turned and went up. Think about some of the parallels. There was only one way down. Could you imagine uh, Wells coming and trying to help someone, and they say, but I don't like stairway A. I prefer stairway B. But sir, ma'am, stairway B will not get you down to safety. There is only one working stairway. I have found it. Of some of the other people I've read that was willing to speak, some people still not even able to speak at that day that was on the 78th floor. But they have their family members to speak that uh, as he was coming, he was making the statement, I have found the way out. Follow me. As he was going and telling others he has found a way out, could you imagine those sitting in that need arguing with him, I don't like stairway A. When a person gets desperate enough, they'll take stairway A. Why well, I'm pointing, and my point there is, there's only one way to heaven. Jesus is the door. He is the only one He's the only way out when Jesus made the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Someone had to have the guts to go up and down, and this uh, young man went up multiple times rescuing others. What a great rescue mission in a day that lives in infamy, in a tragic day, one of the most successful rescue stories. Let's back up into the Garden of Gethsemane. What a fateful day that was. You say, I don't see the tragedy of a 9-11. It's greater still. Because their sin enters into the human race and we see the offset of sin being played out in humanity and it is evil. You say, why does Jesus let it play out? He is letting the evil play out because he's ultimately going to destroy it in the end. And it was Jesus who had the greatest rescue stories. He come and he came down in the robe of a man and an impact zone. See, Jesus went the impact zone. He went right to uh, the 78th floor, the heart of the problem. There he faced the greatest enemy there in the temptation. He fulfilled that, and yet he kept on in his plan with his rescue story, letting everybody know, I know a way out. <laughs> Thomas said, but uh, we, we don't know the way. If you go, we need to know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, truth, and the life. And Jesus come and he sees humanity in a desperate need. If you see people who can't even speak that was on that lobby, they understood their condition. 
Miss Judy Ween said, when I wiped my glasses off, what I saw, all for us to have spiritual eyes where we could see exactly what's going on. The terrorist, the devil, and his minions is making havoc on the lives of folks. And they're trying to shut down every way possible of getting out. Every means of uh, connecting someone who knows the way and to tell them, trying to shut it down. The enemy is trying to stop this rescue story, but I'm telling you, greater than he that is in us than he that's in the world. And if we're willing with the risk, what you and I need to do is put the red bandana on. Ever since I come across this story and started studying, I pray and spiritually put a red bandana on. To go in and give me the calmness, the cooling. It's the way he said it, she said. I have found a way with confidence and security. I have found a way out. Willing to take a risk of going uh, into uh, jet fuel, inundating the whole building. I don't even know what the temperature was there. Willing to take a risk of that magnitude to save people's physical life. And what you and I are called to do is greater still. Because we're dealing with eternal things and eternal life. And where someone will spend eternity. So I want to take time to use this. Greater love hath no man than this. Than a man lay down his life for his friend. We see that in this young man. Uh, Wells Crowther. Remy that is. Is his middle name. Now think about Jesus where he came down. And he provided a way that you and I could live. But here's the deal. He's left you and I here with some red bandanas. <laughs> to go in and rescue the perishing to go into situations where we see and present the gospel, the miracle of stairway A. Hey, wait a minute, we see devastation, we see this, but there is a way out. <laughs> There's a way to safety, and you're getting people to stairway A. Eighteen people, he was willing to do that. If we can just get to one and lead them to the stairway, of course, when I say that, the miracle of stairway A, I'm speaking of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this, as crazy as it gets, and as desperate as the situation and the culture gets, they're going to start eliminating, they'll quit arguing on the fact there's only one way. Right now, you still got some people, well, you say that Bible's right. Well, what makes the distance not right? And uh, you say your ph ph you know, philosophy's right. But there's other worldviews and all that. Let things get crazy. <laughs> Let things get crazy and less argument will come back. <laughs> when people see someone with that determination and someone that's willing to go and rescue what he is doing, it adds validity to the purpose in which God has called us to do. God is calling us to go into the land of these spies, where the spies went into. We see the endangerment, but we go in because there's a rescue mission. Not just leading people in, but others. Do you know that many of David's mighty men came from them, from some of the Hittites, some of the ites that's there? Do you know the rescue mission was not only of Israel going in, but think of the other things. It was others being converted into them, to the truth, that is. God showed his truth through there. And so uh, God is wanting us to have this heart, greater love. And it shows to you and I with a loud megaphone when we're willing to set some things aside for the sake of others in these days. That's what, that's what this was all about. That's what... He did that day. It's right there. And so that's the attitude. Jesus, of course, comparing that he came down. As you see this next slide, I sort of got it. Look, the reason that he came down is that you and I could go up. That's it. He came down that we can go up. Now, he's calling you and I to get people to stairway A, which is Christ, the, the door, right? We can show them the truth. Now, folks, it's as simple as that. There's nothing else complicated. Do you know that when Timothy was needing some help in 1 Timothy, he was needing some help, 
He got in this thing in Ephesus. He was pastoring that church in Ephesus. And, and when you read the historical part of Ephesus, it was, it was crazy there in Ephesus. A lot of paganism, a lot of mindsets, worldviews, a lot of different uh, thoughts. And, and, and so it was just paganism was everywhere. And so he comes in and the church, the truth, starts flourishing there. People start getting converted and he needed folks to help him rescue the parish and train the ones that's getting saved. All right, and coming into the family. And so Paul sends Timothy a letter in 1 Timothy and says, okay, in chapter 3, here's the type of people you're looking for. If any man desire, that's the first thing's desire. I've often wondered, why did Paul put that to Timothy? If any man desire to be in leadership, if any man desires to be, uh, you know, a disciple maker, if anyone's desiring this, you know why? Because here's what I have learned being a coach for several years. I can take someone with a little bit of talent that's got a desire and make a champion out of him than someone that's got great talent with no desire at all. So what a thing, a desire. I mean a mindset that uh, I want in it. Okay, so Paul told Timothy, the first thing you look for is desire. That's it, desire. In these 14 things to look for in someone that's called on to help, do you know not one theological degree is mentioned by Paul to Timothy? Uh, they need to go to college. They need to have a theological degree. They need to be able to quote a certain amount of Bible verses. Uh, they need to be able to say all disciples' names uh, from front to back, list them in their three categories, and then do it backwards. He didn't say that. He didn't even say they got to know all the minor prophets. <laughs> Not only that, you need to know who the minor prophets were speaking to. He didn't say you need to know all that. Every one of these qualifications dealt with just practical stuff in our lives. Practical. To engage and make a difference. He just starts off and says, okay, it starts with desire and goes into different things, which that's not the message this morning. The point I'm trying to relay to you and I is what God's looking for is desire. He's looking for someone with a desire to dig deep to want more. As I was reading about Wells' mother, she said, there's something more. <laughs> I'll not give his statistics, but he come from Boston College and he landed a job and was he making money? <laughs> Boy, he was making money. He was making a lot of money. Matter of fact, a lot of people in the trade center was making a lot of money. <laughs> he really landed a good job. He went to school for it and prepared, but there was something unsatisfied to him. The weekend prior to that, uh, he went out to eat with his parents. Wells did. And that's when he was talking to his dad and said, there's something greater <laughs> If I got to stare at this, I mean, it's something more than money. And his dad said, you know, Wells, that a firefighter makes $27,000 a year. At that particular time in 2001, the first week in September, in which Wells come back to him and said, doesn't matter, money's not an object. He had a desire See, those are the things in which that uh, cannot be taught or wrought. Those are things in which you seek and have. It's something that uh, the Holy Spirit gives. It's something that you can seek when you empty yourself and get full of the Holy Spirit. He gives that desire. Wells had that to see the need of others and see uh, the circumstance we're in and a desire to help. What can I do to help? <clears throat> There's nursery duty. <laughs> can I get a witness? He said, well, I wasn't asking all about that. I've got several ladies that said they could use help getting in and out of their house, getting to church. See, a lot of times coming in and getting help is a lot. Listen, if you got a desire, you come and see me. <laughs> There's so much stuff that needs to be done. The, the problem becomes, and it happened with Timothy, is that when one or two people get spread too thin, then they don't do anything well. When you're spread too thin, you don't do anything well. And so Timothy went to Paul and said, boy, I need some engagement and help. Well, you better not just choose anybody. Here's what you're looking for. Timothy started looking around for all the theologically correct. Everyone's been to Bible college and everyone's been there. And Paul said, you better not look for that. Now, that may be a good thing. And yeah, there's a growing factor. Don't misunderstand. But here's the thing you better look for and engage in the ministry. I want to tell you, you want to be fulfilled. 
when you look at the people, and I know everybody that helped that day was not as dynamic as Wells Grover. It, there was a group of people just bringing water bottles in. And they were just running water bottles where they could pour water on the eyes of folks for clothes. There was all cut thousands of people helped in this at different levels. If it was just contingent on just uh, one fire department, it wouldn't have happened. It was contingent on everyone on that day reacting. And due to the fact of that, I forget the exact numbers, around 14,000 people were saved that day out of the two buildings. Because it was a, a group effort and calling it together. And so I hope that Wells Crother's story inspires you to do your part. You say, are you asking me to go up to the 78th floor? No, few people say, there's some going to do that. You may be down at ground zero and bringing water to someone. You may be at a different point, but everyone's purpose is a very powerful thing and is needed. So what I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to prepare you to do, what I'm letting you know, is that it's the chaotic of the events of that day. And as we're seeing the delusion setting in as well now, as you're hearing all these different voices and what must be done, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to rescue the perishing. We're going to continue to tell people about the way. <laughs> and so we're going to keep the doors open. Uh, unfortunately, the events that we had scheduled here uh, with the town of Longview for the rest of the years all been, you know, shut down. I was just called the other day and said, okay, your national night out, September, uh, the last Wednesday, for some of you didn't know, we was going to meet over there, shut down. Our event in October, shut down. The other event we had in December for the Christmas, for, shut down. Public safety come in and so shut it down. What I'm trying to relate to you is we're not shutting down. So I need you to engage. All right, well, I was going to have a lot of help, of outside help, from different departments, they have been instructed that they cannot do that. So we're going to need some help, because you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to still have the events. <laughs> we're going to have them right here. <laughs> right here on this property, right here. We're going to have the events. So we're planning some great things ahead. We've got several events. Our Sling and Hope Tour is going to be right on October 16th. We're going to have it right here. <laughs> right on the, we need you to engage in that. We need everyone. See, it's a loud meg megaphone when people see people here, letting them know that we love and own some folk. Uh, if y'all don't know what Sonny does on uh, the table of grace, I've mentioned that to some of you, and you're like, what's that? <laughs> and that's people here not even knowing that we feed the hungry once a month, and Sonny comes in early, and the, and the impact there, and, and being here and talking with them, coming in and out, it's a powerful thing. So there's lots of opportunities to help. We're going to be doing uh, a thing on Sunday night, uh, on October 31st, all right, that we're going to engage. We're going to move it here. We're going to do a national night out probably last Wednesday right here, right outside. We're looking to do, uh, now we're praying about this. You help me pray. I'm starting to see some things. I want to get your counsel and help. And some of you, this may be your field. I want to do a drive-through nativity scene maybe. End it with a good... I need a good preacher out there. It's going to give a little mini service. Maybe engage, if Miss Setzer's here, maybe the, the choir at the school to sing some care and engage and give some people something out to do because the reports I got uh, this week is that there's really going to be nothing else to do during that time uh, of things going to be closed down to the public. So we want to be a beacon of light. We need some lights around in our parking lots. Uh, the help, aid, uh, when we have these events. So what I'm screaming out to everyone here, everyone can be involved. You don't have to preach a sermon. You don't have to sing a song. Uh, you, you, you don't have to, but you may have other things that you can be involved and make a difference. So what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, is the impact zone has happened. We need to form a mindset of clarity of what we're doing in the middle of chaos. All right? I feel like this is organized chaos. I personally done it as a basketball coach, so don't tell me that media and propaganda can't do this. As a basketball coach, I created chaos in a full court press that was heavily successful for me for 22 years. Beat down people. And the only thing we've done is we put people in the right place to make it look like we were creating a bunch of crazy, and, and it's hand motions. You wouldn't believe that. When you come up on them, you, 
You start making noises, right? Dead, 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 dead. Right, right, right. You just say stuff at them. You just create chaos and teams that bought into that. We won by big margins. Just by creating, and you see offensive players step back. What I'm trying to say, you've got a lot of organized chaos going on. But what you and I are going to do, we're going to stay clarity of mind. We understand we're on a mission. We're not going to listen to the voice of, of unbelief and the voice of the giants raining down because our focus is on God and we have a mission. And let's get that clarity and understand we're getting together and, and, uh, and we're getting our minds together and hearts together and hands together because we know this, the more chaotic it gets, more people's eyes and ears is going to be open to those with clarity of voice. And so let's unite together from the balcony to down here. May God speak to you of where you can make a difference right here in the coming days ahead for the glory of God. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your great salvation. God, as Wells didn't run away from the chaos, he ran to it. It's because of something he had prepared for. And some of the things he didn't. He found clarity. And God, may that motivate us that, that God, you've called us for the kingdom for such a time as this. Give us clarity of thought and voice. Give us a unity. May we see that people's in need. And under the sound of my voice, everyone here has something to offer the body of Christ. From various things, various places, and various ministries. And so God may this story motivate us to be engaged like never before. May our love begin to be, be loud due to our actions. Not our voices, but our actions. Because it said you demonstrated your love while we were yet sinners on the cross of Calvary. And you shouted loudest on the cross as you were saving us. I'm glad you're the God that hears and you're the God that saves. May we engage in that mission this morning. If there's one here that's never been saved, may their eyes be open and they run to Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet, please.